Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and warm greetings from the Chennai Center for China Studies. Great to meet you all in another C3S institutional dialogue. Our today's discussion is on the topic PRC's political warfare against Taiwan with Professor Kerry Gershanek. For nearly 100 years, the Chinese Communist Party has waged relentless political warfare against the Republic of China, ROC. Media warfare has been a key weapon in this war and it helped contribute to the ROC's retreat to Taiwan in 1949. Over the ensuing 73, 73 years, the Chinese Communist Party vastly expanded its media warfare in its increasingly intense battle for dominance of Taiwan's cognitive domain. By employing media warfare to divide and demoralize the people of Taiwan, the CCP hopes to achieve its goal of annexing Taiwan without having to resort to open kinetic conflict. As the CCP's primary target with a century of experience combating CCP political warfare, Taiwan has much to offer to the world. Let us briefly examine the political warfare goals and strategies the CCP is employing against Taiwan and the outcomes Beijing expects, expects from this effort. Let us hear more from our distinguished speaker. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Kerry Gershanek. Professor Kerry is currently a visiting scholar at the Graduate Institute of East Asian Studies, College of International Affairs, National Chengchi University. He is also a senior research associate at Tamasat University Faculty of Law and the distinguished visiting professor at Chakla Chamklo Royal Military Academy. A former US Marine officer, he has extensive operational experience in the Asia Pacific region from tactical through the national strategic levels. His far reaching academic, governmental, think tank, and research experience in 43 countries over the course of 40 years has provided him with unique expertise in regional security, strategic communications, political warfare, and international relations. With these words, I now request Mr. Sridharan Subramanian, distinguished member, Chennai Center for China Studies, to kindly deliver the opening address. Over to you, sir. Uh, so you're muted, sir. Thanks, thanks Bala. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to Professor Kelly Gershanek. On behalf of C3S, I am truly delighted to welcome Professor Kelly Gershanek to this virtual talk on PRC's political warfare against Taiwan. Professor Gershanek's extensive military background, as given by Bala just a while ago, followed by his academic pursuits, as well as his recent book on Taiwan, make him eminently suitable to introduce the topic to us. I'm pretty sure that those of us China watchers are in for an excellent one hour of time ahead of us, coming as it does on the wake of the fourth Taiwan crisis. The 100-year period of 1815 to 1914 is referred to as Pax Britannica for this stability it brought to the world order, just like the earlier Pax Romana, which lasted from 27 BCE to 180 CE. Xi Jinping now believes that the time has come for Pax Sinica. It is Xi Jinping's intention to replace the existing liberal international order based on the 17th century treaty of Westphalia defined sovereignty, democracy, human rights, and international laws, codes, and conventions with his own idea of community of common destiny. Though Xi is said to describe the contours of such a new order, it will essentially be a China-led world order with Chinese characteristics for the new era. Xi is convinced that China should give up the ideas of biding its time and hiding its strength because he believes that the time has come now and enough strength has been accumulated by China already. We in India are well aware of these machinations, tactics, strategies of PRC. The most recent experience being the incidents in Ladakh starting in May 2020 when COVID was actually peaking. Several confidence building measures, CBMs in existence along the border since the 1980s were blatantly violated by the Chinese in these clashes. Only a robust counterattack, followed by continuing uncompromised diplomacy stopped China in its tracks. A similar response in the tri-junction with Bhutan once again stopped the incursion of China five years back. No other country had had a kinetic engagement with China in recent memory. There is a lesson to be learned from these incidents, therefore. The calm and resolute response by the Taiwanese armed forces to the recent grave provocations, including by the political 
leaders of the country are commendable. The bankruptcy suffered by many nations of the Belt and Road Initiative, the complete disregard to the unclos arbitration, the aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy practiced by Chinese diplomats in many world capitals during the COVID pandemic, the incursions into the ADIZ of Taiwan and Japan, which have become regular features every day now, the idea of immediate punishment to countries that demur to challenge China, the feverish pace at which China is amassing nuclear weapons, missiles, naval and air assets, the ambition to dominate and exploit space and celestial bodies, and the extraordinary military siege of Taiwan after Ms. Pelosi's visit recently point to where China wants to go, namely stage an all-encompassing effort to become a true blue middle kingdom. Taiwan and South China, which for historical reasons must be renamed as Indochina Sea, are the crucial linchpin in this hegemonic ambition of China. The issue is not only between Taiwan and China anymore, because of China's maritime claims, claims, its new maritime laws, its massive coast guard and maritime militia, and its recent announcement that the Taiwan Straits was no longer an international waterway. As, the, as per the central dictum of the Chinese art of war, PRC would strive to achieve its ambition through non-military means as far as possible, through a show of massive force to induce fear, through threats, coercion, punishments, deception, disinformation, contrived legalism, etc. The recent white paper by the Taiwan Affairs Office of the State Council proves that point. China manufactures history and resorts to vague memories to lay claim to Indochina Sea, Taiwan, Raikyu, Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, Tibet, etc. A study of the Chinese history shows that whenever an emperor entertained an extravagant ambition and worked towards achieving that goal, not only his rule, but even the dynasty collapsed. After the abolition of the Qing dynasty in 1911 and attempts at constitutional monarchy and republicanism, we have seen the reincarnation of the imperial dynasty in the form of the Communist Party of China now, whose last 10 years have seen the rebirth of Tianzi, the son of heaven, with extravagant ambition once again. With these few words about the realities of People's Republic of China present day, I now invite Professor Kerry Gershenek to enlighten us on the issue of political warfare on Taiwan, a country with which India's trade, political, and people-to-people -people contact have been growing, especially in the last decade. Professor Kerry Gershenek, please. Well, thank you, sir, for that, uh, that deeply profound and a very informative introduction that set the tone perfectly. Um, if we could go to the slides right now on the screen. Bala. Uh, Professor, can I present now? Yes, can you put the slides up on the screen right now? At any rate, the um, uh, while we're waiting for the uh, for the slide, um, the, the focus on Taiwan for the talk today, this is obviously the direct result of uh, Nancy Pelosi, our Speaker of the House, third in line for the President of the United States, visit to Taiwan um, in early August. And so the, the response uh, by the PRC, the unhinged response, um, we'll come back to a little bit later on in the discussion, but just as background, uh, the, the ramped up political warfare within uh, Northeast Asia against Taiwan, but globally by the PRC, uh, makes this a, a timely discussion right now. So thank you for uh, C3S for inviting me to come in and talk. Next slide, please. Okay, we, uh, we just heard about imagined history on the part of the PRC. This, uh, this 1938 map, actually uh, done by the Nationalists, by Chiang Kai-shek, is imagined history. This is, this is what the current regime, the CCP, has inherited from the KMT, the Nationalists, as their China dream. This is what they imagine China looked like long ago, and hence, uh, because of um, this legal warfare, this map warfare, and uh, historical warfare that 
games that they play, or they're not, they're not games, they're very serious issues, but um, this is what they want to reconstitute when they say to reunify, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just to take Taiwan, and the term is annex, not reunify, because there's really no valid justification to say that China ever owned Taiwan for any significant time beyond around 12 or 14 years, and then never administered it. We'll get to that again later if we have time. But the point is, this is political warfare. This map is political warfare inherited by the CCP and used as a justification to hypernationalize their own people and to indoctrinate and uh, condition people, supporters, enablers, united fronts worldwide to support their, their ever expansionist foreign policy. So as you can see, uh, it might be a surprise to the people in Singapore, but they are part of China. It might be a surprise to the people of Thailand and the, the Gulf of Thailand that you are all part of China. And I assure you, if, if Taiwan is annexed, every other element on here, every other area that's uh, shown on this map, that'll be next in line. The Senkakus on the East China Sea for Japan and, and then territory in India. You know the game. Next slide, please. So this is political warfare as well. I always start out my discussions on political warfare to, uh, with uh, headlines or current um, events that are going on. Um, this complements the previous slide, the, the slide of uh, the, the land of what is India, the land of what is many other sovereign countries now uh, that the PRC claims to be its territory. Um, part of the themes, one of the, the themes that the PRC relentlessly comes back to is reunification of China, that is taking your land, uh, taking the land of Bhutan, make, taking others' land, is inevitable. It's an inevitable trend of history. It's unstoppable. Don't fight us. If you ever saw any of America's pretty, uh, pretty funny uh, alien invasion movies from the 1950s, you had Aliens broadcasting to the earth, you puny earthlings, don't fight us, you cannot win. That's the way the CCP comes across as a really bad science fiction movie, always saying, you cannot beat us. It's inevitable that we will win. Next slide, please. This incidentally is from uh, the very massive uh, China military online. They, the PLA, unlike the U.S. and other democracies, the PLA plays a, a massive role in China's political warfare, whether it's media operations, media warfare, as you know it's called, um, and then liaison department and uh, an outfit called KFIC, which targets your senior officers, your generals, your admirals, other people, senior up in your government, and their, their chief assistants. Uh, they've co-opted uh, several American admirals and generals over the years. I would suspect that India has had the same problem. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, what's causing, uh, the, what, what caused all of the uproar at the beginning of August and threats of war was, uh, again, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. But Global Times... Um, Look, look at the look at the propaganda here, and, and note that it's not subtle at all. It's talking about demarches and things diplomatic, and it's showing an anti-submarine warfare helicopter in the the propaganda uh, news that goes out. No, by the way, this isn't Global Times, as you know, is not aimed at uh, simply the internal audiences. The one, as we're always reminded, the one point four billion people of China who righteously uh, defend our sovereignty and, and the reunification. No, Global Times, with, through partnerships in your country, through partnerships in America, with American news media, in, uh, in media in Africa, uh, uh, across uh, South America, uh, partnerships with news media organizations, what they'll do is they'll take a Global Times or a Xinhua article as part of their media warfare, sign these agreements, um, and I'll go into a little bit more about this later, but the bottom line is they'll translate this, say, into uh, Portuguese for Brazil, 
And the Portuguese papers, out of you know, agreement, but out of laziness as well, they'll run this article verbatim, but in Portuguese, making it look like it was their reporters who reported this, and get, hence giving it credibility so the people in Portugal, for example, don't understand this is pure Chinese Communist Party propaganda. So again, just another example of propaganda, and don't don't assume that it's just aimed at the internal audience and those who who read this overseas. It's translated and run in local news media in many places around the world as a local uh, news story. Next slide, please. So this is not from the PRC. This is out of Taiwan, but. Um, they're getting better in Taiwan. They, they, for a number of historical reasons we can go to if we have time, uh, Taiwan has not been very good at countering the PRC's political warfare against it. It goes back to the White Terror when the nationalists were in charge, slaughtered 10,000 Taiwanese in 1947 and kept martial law uh, until um, the, the mid-80s, early 80s. Um, so the, the laws in Taiwan have been weak the organizations in Taiwan have not had, especially since democratization in the 1990s, the laws since the country democratized and the capabilities, they did away with a lot of them. You know, it's good if you're living under a dictatorship, um, it's good to get rid of a lot of that, um, the, the mechanism, the organizations, but you don't throw it all out. And, and Taiwan threw a lot of its self-defense capabilities out. Uh, and then after 1996, when they actually freely were able to elect their leaders and they, they started uh, opening up and become truly democratic. So now they're able to track the disinformation much better, especially since 2018. They're, they're building the capability to detect, um, deter, counter, defeat of the four elements that we look at when you're dealing with uh, PRC political warfare. They're getting better at it. And this this uh, this countering political warfare news article I thought might be interest of me to you. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. When it comes up, bottom line is it will talk about dozens of anti-China figures. This is out of Global Times again. Uh, it's another example of political warfare. The headline will read dozens of anti-China figures, including Benny Tai and Joshua Wong, plead guilty, sending a deterrent to, Thai, uh, to secessionists. That's political warfare. All the people involved in the Hong Kong democracy protests, those who were standing up to Beijing saying, no, you signed an agreement with London that said we had 50 years of our freedoms. We had 50 years that we would live under our system before we figured out how we'd integrate into uh, the PRC. And of course, the PRC's attitude under Xi Jinping was, huh, that's just a piece of paper, it doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything more now. So all the people who were left behind who couldn't escape Hong Kong when Xi Jinping cracked down in uh, the new national security law that gave him what he thought was the legal authority to go in and crush Hong Kong as political warfare theater, just like the communists historically do going back to Lenin. A lot of those people are being sent to jail, some for as long as uh, 30 years or life imprisonment. So people whose names that we saw a few years ago that we were proud of leading the charge for uh, democracy in, um, in Hong Kong, they're now going to jail. They're now being punished pretty severely. And that's what is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. That is the SOP for communist regimes, particularly the PRC. Uh, when you're left behind Taiwan, if you're under their jackboot, this is what they do. Okay, are we able to get the slides to work at all, Bala? Okay, well, Bala's working that apparent technical issue. Okay, now next slide after the uh, 
the Hong Kong one. I want to I want to show the uh, South China Morning Post, which, as you know, has been pretty much parrots the PRC line now. It used to be a it used to be a uh, pretty reputable uh, publication, but uh, now a lot of times it parrots the the PRC line. Okay, next slide, please. I think everyone's familiar with the reason I put this Global Times about uh, Hong Kong up. So again, Global Times sending, or not Global Times, but the CCP sending out through one of its arms overseas, is, you know, South China Morning Post. Uh, this is what we're going to do to you, Taiwan. You all know what's going on, the genocide against the Uyghurs. You all know what goes on in their re-education camps. Now they're saying openly, in the form of um, this uh, PRC ambassador to France, this is exactly what we're going to do to you, Taiwan, when we take over. Um, and not all the people that go into the re-education camps are going to come out alive. You know, the torture, the rape, the, uh, the, the political indoctrination, the destruction of the human soul. There's, there's many, many articles out on what's going on uh, to the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang uh, area. Um, we know what they're going to do. So as political warfare, they're, they're uh, telling the world, you know, just expect this is what we're going to do. We're just not going to admit to the torture, the, the executions, the rape, etc. But we're going to re-educate them. So they're preparing the world for what's going to happen uh, if, if and when they take Taiwan. Next slide, please. All right, so though that's sort of my introduction, trying to give a sense to everybody so we have a, um, I'm building a common understanding of political warfare. So I'm gonna go through in my PRC political warfare overview, I'm gonna sort of do a review, what should be a review for most of you, but what I find routinely, and I saw it again last week at a conference that I was at with 20 people, uh, lawyers, uh, senior officials from 27 different countries, the vast majority didn't understand what political warfare is. Um, so what I do when I, I give a presentation, I take a few minutes to give it an overview. What is PRC political warfare? And as we were discussing before we, we started the program, India knows well what's being done against you, against your, against Bollywood, against your think tanks, uh, through your tech sectors. Uh, through your media, you know you know very well how the PRC is infiltrating, trying to demoralize, trying to divide you, uh, trying to to make you submit to become almost a vassal state or a tributary state, like they're doing to so many other barbarian countries. Um, you, you know what's going on, but it's always useful to have a quick review of what do we mean by political warfare. So we're all speaking the same language. Next slide, please. Oh, and then I'll talk about case study Taiwan and then give some recommendations I've given to my country in Taiwan and, you know, whatever applies to India, please feel free to take it if, if you haven't done it already. So political warfare, um, one of our great heroes, the one who came up with the, the strategy that we used to defeat the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and that communist regime during the Cold War is a guy named George Kennan. So he said from the American perspective, political warfare is everything at your command short of kinetic warfare, set of, short of shooting artillery rounds, dropping bombs, sending bullets down range, uh, whatever you need to do what, uh, to achieve your national objectives short of war, we'll call that political warfare. It's a pretty useful definition. He, he, there was more detail to that, but that, that, helped, that, that definition helped America in 1948 when we were losing. We weren't doing too well against the Soviet Union in Western Europe and in and, and other locations trying to push back on the, the Soviet Union's expansionism. Okay, so that helped turn my country around back in 1948. We started getting pretty good at, at political warfare. So the CCP view of that, they've taken that and put that on steroids, ladies and gentlemen. It's, for them, it's total war. And it could include violence, of course. It, they call it, uh, it's not a doctrinal term, but it's a term that they fully understand and they employ. They call it unrestricted warfare. And everything's permitted in it. And we'll talk about what that everything is uh, for the next couple of minutes. Next slide, please. 
All right. So in, in my books, the one you can get for free, you can download is the political warfare book uh, by Marine Corps University Press. Lay out about 40 different terms that in America we use to define or to identify aspects, parts of what is really political warfare. Now, this is nice that we have all this terminology and that the full 40 aren't up there. Uh, nor are the full 24 terms that uh, two PLA Air Force officers in 1999, when they wrote the book, Unrestricted Warfare, they identified uh, 24 uh, warfares as part of their un unrestricted warfare. So that puts us at about 64 or 70 different terms that we have to use to identify what the heck it is that China's doing to us. So that hurts us. Because if your bureaucracies are like American bureaucracies, you'll say if you're a diplomat, oh, I do diplomacy and I do public diplomacy uh, and maybe a little bit of public affairs, but I don't do cognitive warfare. I don't fight subversion. I, don't, uh, I do soft power, but I don't, I don't fight back on sharp power. You get the point that each person, each specialist in your government is the same as the specialist in my government. Unless you have a larger holistic view to bring all of these terms together as war in general, they'll continue to look at each one of these functions in a, what we call in America a stovepipe fashion. That is just looking down the pipe of, say, um, deception or just looking as to Americans too often do. They, they love the term fake news. Um, and we're, we're going to fight fake news. You have a program out of the U.S. Embassy in Delhi where they're helping India fight fake news. Well, fake news is merely a tactic. Uh, that's all it is. It's, it, it, it's, it, it can hurt, but it's only a tactic. It's one of about 60 or 70 different functions that are being, or operations that are being waged against us. So if you, if you just stovepipe your focus on, say, fake news or lawfare, you're going to lose the war. It's just like only focusing on infantry operations when you're fighting a real war and not focusing on naval uh, surface warfare, undersea warfare, naval aviation, air force aviation, ground, uh, close air support, strategic bombers, um, and then infantry, armor, artillery, cyber warfare. If you don't bring all these warfares together and all these capabilities together, you're going to lose. So I bring this up because, um, again, we stumble over this in America frequently. I suspect you may have a similar uh, counterproductive massive terminology problem in India. Next slide, please. Okay, so my recommendation, uh, keep pounding at home in America, stop pretending that we're simply in strategic competition with China. We're not. They call it political warfare. That's where, you know, they're, they're calling it in all their doctrinal publications, what they train their, their military officers from since they are second lieutenants and ensigns. They're trained in, to call it political warfare and think of it in terms of warfare. That's what we ought to call it. Otherwise, you can never conceptualize the threat and then you can never come up with the policies, the uh, strategies, the, you know, set the objectives, develop the resources the doctrine to fight and, and to counter it and defeat it. So call it political warfare, and then we can properly begin to fight back. Next slide, please. You're familiar with the goals of the PRC. First and foremost, it's, uh, it's not in order there. They, it's regime preservation. CCP wants to stay in power. They're gonna do everything they can to stay in power. So, um, that's the number one goal of their political warfare. Political warfare to the CCP is both internal to their own people and then external globally. But the other one and the one that you're concerned about and, and, and we are in America is the regional and then ultimately global hegemony that they want to achieve. Um, as we heard in that wonderful introduction, um, China is going to become the middle kingdom once again, the hegemon, to use uh, Chinese terminology. And uh, we're all going to become vassal states uh, or um, in some way we will have to submit to them. They'd like to do it without firing a shot, but uh, some of the people I know in academia who are actually familiar with the term political warfare and know a little bit about what it is, 
um, don't quite understand in Taiwan and in America that the, the, the Chinese version of winning without fighting does not mean without a protracted struggle, the very Maoist pro protracted struggle that brought them to victory, the CCP to victory in 1949. That's the struggle they're in against your country, against India, against the democracies, against America. They know it's going to be long grinding and it's going to be violent at times. They just don't want to pay the price of going to mid intensity or high intensity kinetic conflict if they do not have to. Next slide, please. Okay, so when the next slide comes up, it's going to talk about, I'll talk about um, the objectives, talk about goals. We always talk about goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, and resources. You always got to think in those terms if you got want to have a fighting chance. So I've talked about the goals and the framework. The objectives are for the PRC, for its political warfare, support internal unity and, and repress its people through its political warfare if they won't willingly comply and submit. And then regional hegemony, uh, and global hegemony, as I've talked about already. They do this, their goal is to influence governments, uh, international institutions like the World Health Organization, as we saw that be compromised and corrupted very badly during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, the UN, uh, the, the, that, that Chinese PRC CCP members are on the Human Rights Commission is an outrage at the UN, but they've also made a concerted effort to take over many of the other leadership and management uh, billets within the UN. And uh, of course, individuals, uh, they, they've got a number of American businessmen in their pocket. They've got a uh, number of other people in our entertainment industry in their pocket. Um, so they're influencing governments, organizations, institutions, and people on a massive scale. Um, and their other objective is to divide for their enemies, divide, demoralize their enemies. And the term that the PRC uses is disintegrate their enemies and their critics. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, going back to their imagined history, the 1938 map of national humiliation, there's, there's another version of it that calls it the map of national shame. To, uh, to, to, again, the design to lay a guilt trip on the rest of the world and also to hypernationalize the people of China to go and take all these, these countries that now exist in your terrain as well. So the military objective is to regain what you see in front of you. Next slide, please. It's to reunify in their terms, but it's basically to, to, to expand and take these countries. In addition, military objective is to break the first and second island chain coming towards uh, America. Okay, so right now with Taiwan in place, still a free demo a democratic country, um, not under the jackboot of, of Beijing. The, the first island chain is still exists, but the, the PRC is working very aggressively to bypass the first and second island chain. You know what's going on in the Solomon Islands. Basically, they're affecting a coup d'etat there um, through the, the prime minister who's in charge, who they bought off along with the majority of members of their parliament down there uh, who've been bought off at uh, some up to a million dollars a piece. Um, so they want to break out again, militarily break through the first and second island chains. And right now they're working a pretty successful political warfare campaign to bypass those chains. Next slide, please. First, though, annex Taiwan. That's that's first on their hit parade. And even while well, they're still trying to put, to put pressure on India uh, militarily and, and through political warfare and on America and other countries, first and foremost on Xi Jinping's hit parade is annex Taiwan. Next slide, please. But it's not just Taiwan, of course. It's India, it's um, 
North America, South America, all, all of this is a, the, the apparatus involves that the PRC uses involves millions of people, literally millions. It's hard for us to conceive of that because we're a democracy. But the apparatus is a global apparatus, the United Front organizations, the um, uh, other organizations uh, that they will take a quick look at in the next slide. But every, every place, including the Arctic and the Antarctic, they're targets of a well-orchestrated PRC political warfare apparatus and uh, policies and campaigns. Next slide, please. All right, this is an eye chart, I realize, sorry about that. But the idea of this is to show that it's top-down focus. Xi Jinping's dad, his father was a political warfare officer, okay? Um, he did a lot to repress the people of Tibet. And so that runs in Xi Jinping's blood. It's the air that he breathes is political warfare. So he's really pushed to the forefront, the united front under his regime. Had a lot of funding, a lot of resources before, but on under Xi Jinping, the united front work department is on steroids now. So you look at the, the very top red, red uh, symbols up there, the CCP Central Committee and then the National People's Congress Standing Committee, the, the detailed instruction on, on their political warfare against us comes from the very top. Now, think about that. In democracies, you have to have special authorization for what we consider active measures, for, for some of what we consider to be political warfare. And it's pretty fragmented, at least in the case of America, the way we, we conducted, and it's got very close supervision. Under the CCP version, it's all top-down driven. You're expected if you're, you're, no matter where you are in China, who you are, and if you're Chinese overseas, you are expected, you are mandated by national law to support that political warfare apparatus and its objectives. Then you go down through, and you can see later on, if you want to look at this slide, uh, Bala's got it, and he can distribute it to you. But it, it shows you all some of the key organizations going down through the news media, the central propaganda department, et cetera, who are engaged in this. But it involves millions of people and hundreds of billions of dollars over the years. Next slide, please. And the PLA, of course, through the, the relatively new organization called the Strategic Support Force. Um, that's not to be confused with the Strategic Rocket Forces, which a couple of people did at the conference I was at last week. No, there's a strategic support force, cyber operations, those kind of things, but they've, they've taken over much of the political warfare uh, within the, uh, the PLA. So this again is an eye chart, but it's to show you that again, everything is being run centrally, basically out of the CCP and the, and, and the state council on the, the party state side. Every business, every state owned enterprise, every individual under China's laws has to support their MIS, the military, the, the, uh, the, their Chinese intelligence services, MSS is what I meant, Ministry of State Security, uh, all Chinese intelligence services, you must by Chinese law support it if you're from China, or in their interpretation of Chinese descent as part of the overseas diaspora around the world, the, uh, the overseas Chinese, as we call them, uh, you're, you're required to uh, support their intelligence operations, their political warfare operations, um, even if they don't try to take you back and punish you in China. If you have extended family back in China, they will punish your family if you do not help them. Again, it involves hundreds of billions of dollars, and uh, you can see the concentric circles, how they reach out to, to, to influence American elementary school children, not just our universities, not just our high schools, which was a surprise to a lot of people uh, I talk to when I give talks. They're shooting for elementary school kids. They're shooting for our business leaders. They're shooting for our defense leaders. Uh, they, and the people, key people in between. So again, this is a massive operation. Next slide, please. All right. PLA political warfare, I won't spend a lot of time on this. But uh, you, you deal with them. You're confronting these people every day. Your, uh, your officials meet with the PLA every day. You know the game they're playing against you. Um, but the, the, the one, one organization I'd point out to you down at the bottom, you may have a different name. What they, they may have a different organization name 
for what they're doing against India. But the one that's been a bit effective against American armed forces is the China Association of International Friendly Contacts, uh, KFIC. And they've actually co-opted a, a, a former vice chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff. They co-opted retired Army, Navy, Marine Corps generals and, and uh, Coast Guard admirals. Uh, former defense officials and certainly uh, others, but this is an organization that's specifically designed to target your military and I bring it to your attention because I've seen firsthand where they've actually co-opted American, especially retired American officers and some on active duty. Next slide, please. So Again, I'm not going to go through all of this. I think you're all familiar with it, but I just want to make sure we all have the same terminology. You know what a united front is? You've got them in India. Um, news article from a couple of years ago in the U.S., there were 600 united fronts operating in the United States alone. I would guarantee you at this point it's more than 1,000. Uh, the three warfares, if you haven't studied those, strategic psychological warfare, media warfare, legal warfare, please do. For those of you who do understand it, you'll... Uh, I'm not going to spend much time uh, because I assume that most of you, if not all of you, understand this. The active measures, most Americans don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the proxy warfare that goes on in Nepal. They don't understand the proxy warfare that in Myanmar, that America is very concerned about, that there is a proxy PRC army in the United Wa State Army that owns a piece of, of land there the size of the country of Belgium. And it's basically a proxy army that dictates to the government of Myanmar what Myanmar can and cannot do um, if, uh, and is ready to be employed if it doesn't do what Beijing wants. Online terror, the, uh, the social media warfare, I think you see that in India as much as, as, as uh, China um, conducts social media warfare across Southeast Asia and against Taiwan, I would be surprised if it's not a massive uh, onslaught against India. And I'd be interested to hear later how well the uh, India people of India push back against that. Digital colonization, cyber warfare, we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. And then, of course, the military intimidation against you, the threats that the, quote, India, you better listen up because the countdown has begun in their propaganda. You've heard that before. You know they're trying to terrorize you. They're trying to intimidate you with military threats. Um, and same thing with Australia. They threatened to nuke Australia. They threatened to nuke Japan through their official, official propaganda organs, okay? That's all political warfare. Next slide, please. I'll let you just glance at the slide, but everything that's on there, I would wager is being done against you. Your academia is infiltrated just like, uh, not to, I don't know how much, but in America, a lot of our institutions get a lot of funding from China, either directly or through uh, businesses that China funds. And then the business dictates to the university how to, how to self-censor, how to, how to support the PRC. All of these others, uh, weaponized tourism is big uh, now that Chinese tourism is beginning, now that COVID is over, you'll see much more return to weaponized tourism. Uh, for uh, Taiwan, they're just trying to strangle Taiwan diplomatically. All Everything you see up on the screen uh, is being done to some extent against your country and against the countries of South Asia, as well as Taiwan and my country. Next slide, please. Criminal gangs, uh, Canada can tell you about casino warfare as can an island nations in the, in the Pacific Ocean. They start casinos, funnel in a lot of money, buy off politicians through the casinos and organized crime that runs them. And that, that's a very powerful way. I, I'd be interested to hear if that's happening in India later. Um, the rest of these paramilitary organizations in Japan, radical activists who, who stopped Japan from building up to be able to defend itself uh, and to build up uh, really useful military capabilities. You, you probably, you know, you know all about, all about that in India. Um, the media warfare, a lot of once legitimate news organizations have been taken over by the PRC. Sometimes it's through advertising. They get Chinese uh, influenced businesses to either pull their advertising 
if uh, a, a newspaper or a radio station is criticizing China, or if the, the news organization agrees to support China, then they'll give it lots of advertising dollars. Next slide, please. Okay, I've already talked about United Fronts. Uh, BRI is a massive United Front effort. We'll talk about that if we got time. I'm down to about 15 minutes now, so I'm going to blast through some of these slides. Next slide, please. Media warfare, if you look at this chart, I'm sure you'll you'll identify every step there that uh, has been taken in India as well as Taiwan, as you know, as well as the United States. Um, and then the as part of media warfare, it's not just building massive multi-billion dollar uh, PRC global media networks. They're signing agreements, as we talked about earlier in, the, in my discussion. They sign agreements with your news media. And basically, your news media and my news media in America start acting as agents of influence for the Chinese Communist Party. And they buy and co-op media. They use business to, again, Maoist concepts surround. Business surrounds the media. The, you know, go back to the media, uh, the people surround the cities. Uh, they, the Chinese, uh, the PRC actually says this, that we're going to use business uh, Sino, in Thailand's case, Sino-Thai businessmen with close ties to the PRC uh, surround the media, and they cut off funding for that media that uh, is critical of China, and they, they massively support media that will support China. Okay, um, social media warfare, WeChat terror, we can talk about that more later if you're interested, but again, it's powerful, and I'm interested to hear what's happening in, in India on that regard. Next slide, please. A uh, one point out of here again. They're shooting. They're aiming. They're targeting our children. Video games, TikTok video games. They're brainwashing our children. They're propagandizing ch uh, children, kids, teens, tweens, all of them who play video games. Mo many video games are made in China, and they insert. It's a conscious effort to insert narratives and political warfare themes into the games and other products that they put out of Tencent and all the other organizations that distribute them worldwide. And of course, their movies as part of indoctrinement. Next slide, please. Okay, United or the BRI, you're familiar with that. Obviously, wherever they go for part of BRI, they're making friends of a lot of powerful and rich businessmen and politicians. One way they're doing it is buying them off. Uh, but basically, these are votes. These BRI countries are also votes in the UN. They're votes in other international organizations. So uh, the PRC gets a lot out of it, in addition to uh, potential and very likely access for military facing for the PLA Navy, PLA Air Force, and ultimately, perhaps, PLA uh, Marine Corps. Next slide, please. And again, uh, look closely what's going on in the, the Pacific Islands. I'm sure you already are. But Tonga, um, uh, the Solomons, Micronesia, there's massive efforts being made to take these. We, we, some people call them small island nations. Don't think of it that way. Think of them as large ocean nations and what they offer in terms of EEZs, resources, and fisheries, and then strategically cutting off Australia, New Zealand, uh, support for India coming that way from America. Um, once, once China owns several of these countries, they've got basing that can interdict with their, with their military capabilities, that can interdict support if there is a crisis where we have to surge capabilities to the region. Next slide, please. Digital Silk Road is a serious issue that most people I talk to don't fully understand. Huawei, oh yeah, they're just going to help us get 5G in our country. No, they're not. When they go into your country as part of the Digital Silk Road, it's digital colonization. It's, they're setting up surveillance system. They're data mining all of that data in your country and taking it back to China, using it for their purposes. 
They're helping countries build surveillance states, uh, the ones who aren't necessarily democracies and some that are borderline democracies. Uh, are there, China's assisting them to set up uh, surveillance states, which of course China is utilizing the data from that within China as well, not just the country that they claim to be hacking, uh, helping. Next slide, please. It's a powerful slide, but again, it, it shows that a lot of times they hack, they get into our systems, um, and they distort information in our computers as part of political warfare, not just espionage, but they're actually distorting information. Um, so I like that picture because it gets across that you don't know what they're doing when they're inside your computer systems because they have so, uh, software that can turn off your spyware, um, your all your software you have that you think that's helping you as, as a business. They are actually turn or they they turn off theirs, their um, mechanisms. There's uh, when the spyware gets turned on. Next slide, please. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, you have five more minutes. Got it. Next slide, please. All right, so Taiwan offers an existential threat to the PRC because it shows that uh, that the Chinese people don't need the jackboot of uh, PRC or CCP, totalitarian genocidal fascism, to keep Chinese people in line. They can govern themselves. I've been told this by people from the PRC, and of course, yeah, it makes sense. Um, so they've got to destroy it. They want to end the civil war that they thought ended in 1949. They want to destroy the Republic of China. So basically, we've got the military threat, which is being ramped up. And I think we will see G being willing to invade uh, Taiwan. Uh, but again, topic of a different discussion. But he prefers to st still try to subjugate, terrorize, demoralize, and divide the people of Taiwan and then win without having to to destroy a lot of Taiwan's infrastructure by invading. Next slide, please. Okay, we already talked about goals, objectives, and all of that, so I won't go into this. They're basically doing in Taiwan what I spoke about is being done in general. Next slide, please. Again, We've already talked about this selected tactics, but I've seen these up close and personal. Everything on this slide I've seen uh, since being a, a visiting scholar in Taiwan. Next slide, please. Target audiences, business, news media, KMT party officials, senior military officials and retired officials. Note that they that school principals and a lot of retirees because retirees still influence in Taiwan have great influence on people still working actively on the civilian side in government and on the military side. Okay, and notice too that Buddhist organizations, uh, uh, PRC uses Buddhism as part of its political warfare uh, uh, campaigns and in, in Taiwan they're effective. Next slide please. Themes, I'll you can look at them later if you're interested, but they, you've seen them before. Uh, next slide, please. But big, big part of that theme as we go to the next slide is they're trying to convince the intelligentsia, the elites of Taiwan, democracy doesn't work. You've seen that as a PRC gambit around the world. The China model is the model democracy doesn't work. Okay, so PRC's hope for outcomes, you know, pretty much take Taiwan, use it as a power projection platform, exploit its technology and its people, and re-educate uh, in what they call re-educate the people of Taiwan. Next slide, please. And then, of course, push America out of the region, effectively uh, uh, destroying U.S. influence in the region. Next slide, please. This is what the region's going to look like if the PRC annexes Taiwan and its political warfare is successful. Next slide. And then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, so that's basically what you're going to see, a lot of basing and access rights. Um, and um, you'll have a, still have an actual facility or a short access in different places because if Taiwan falls, a lot of other countries are going to say it's not worth 
not worth standing up for our sovereignty anymore will be vassal states or tributary states. Next slide, please, and then we'll go to questions if we have time. This is a book you can download for free, incidentally, and it, it goes into a lot of recommendations, which I don't have time to go into right now, but things India might want to look at because we're trying to implement them in the U.S. and the organization I'm working with is actually working with countries in Asia to help implement the uh, from Chapter 9, the recommendations, and also the appendix, the curriculum for a five-day course on political warfare. I'm done. Bala, all yours. <laughs> Hopefully, there's a few seconds left. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. My colleague, Ms. Uh, Shweta, will take in the questions from the chat box for you. Over to you, Shweta. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Yeah, please talk slowly because you're, you're, I'm getting feedback as uh, you speak from your side. Yeah, sure, sir. So the first question is by Shubhdeep Mandal. Uh, China has bombarded the U.S. with media warfare during the time of Nancy Pelosi's visit. So I'd yes. like to know your views regarding the evolution of Chinese media warfare tactics. Oh, it's gotten infinitely more sophisticated. Um, they have the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal hand, uh, distributing China Daily. Uh, they, they pay them so much money and... Uh, other key uh, newspapers in America are paid to distribute uh, for free China Daily. Um, our, our news media organizations uh, basically, uh, if they want to operate out of China, they have to comply to an extent with what the Chinese want. You see what's happened. There's only about a handful of, of good reporters left in Beijing, at least from, from America's perspective. All the others were forced out. They were beaten, they were, uh, they were harassed, their visas were pulled, but they got rid of reporters who were good in Beijing. That's part of their media warfare. Uh, so they've been successful in that. America has not fought back effectively on that. We should be kicking out their reporters in America because we got about a handful, maybe five to nine. They've got uh, about 500, 300 to 500, depending how you count them in America. So again, they've been very successful in co-opting um, particular news media, in particular buying radio stations. Um, but we're getting a little bit better now at identifying what's being done to us and pushing back, uh, especially under the Trump administration. Uh, we actually forced uh, the, the PRC media or their propaganda organs like Xinhua, to, to, they have to register as foreign agents and then have to disclose what money they're spending uh, buying people and organizations here in the U.S. Uh, hopefully that helps, but it's a much longer discussion required to, to examine it completely. I don't want to take up all the time on that. Uh, so the next question is also by Shuddeep. Uh, the Tibetan glacier is the house of major Asian rivers. So if possible, could you tell us your views regarding the Tibet status to China, whether if it is purely from the perspective of peripheral security or if hydrological warfare also plays an important role? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, so um, I'm not, I am familiar uh, with the situation from an academic standpoint. I don't live there like you all do, everyone I'm talking to. So I don't pretend to be, to have the expertise that everybody at uh, C3S has, who's, who I'm talking to today, it's hydrological warfare. That's what, uh, that's what they're doing on the, with the Mekong River, the Long Kong Mekong Initiative. It's, they're basically trying to get the water. You know the drought that's going on inside the PRC right now. You know the major problems they've got. Um, they want the high ground. Any, any military uh, officer who's in the audience right now, you understand that generally you take the high ground, you win. Well, there's nothing higher in Asia and the world than the Himalayas. So you get the high ground, but Tibet, you understand why. They claim they owned it forever. Look at the map, the propaganda map, the 1938 map. They didn't, of course. Um, so they want it for control of the water. They wanted it for control of their, their perimeter, their, their borders. And um, so I can, I'm, I'm sure there's other reasons, but those are the two reasons that if you'd asked me without your wonderful preface, 
uh, for that question. I, those are the two reasons. They want the water, they want to be able to control the five rivers, and they want to be able to dominate the people of Tibet and hence use that area for power projection, at least their own uh, security for the, the PRC. Thank you, sir. The next couple of questions is by Mahir. And the first question is, what do you make of the alleged bubble burst of Chinese banks and how it will further impact China's attempts at political warfare and psychological war? The next question is, how do you view what, the what, interest? What, 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 one question oh. at a time. One. Okay. Um, I've only had, bear with me, I've only had one cup of coffee. Okay, so one question at a time. Please say the first one, okay. the first words of your first question because I, I couldn't hear them well. Okay. I did something. Okay. How does it how does it affect political warfare? But I couldn't hear what it is. Is it banks? Uh, yeah. So it's about uh, what do you make of the alleged bubble burst of Chinese banks? Uh, and how will okay. it further impact China's attempts at political warfare? Okay. Um, not a. I'm not an economist. Don't. Don't pretend to be, uh, but my gut reaction as an academic and someone who looks at political warfare, one, uh, there was an internal assessment within China recently saying if we invade Taiwan, like we're saying we're going to do, here's the trillions of dollar damage that will be done if India, if Japan, if the, the, the Quad nations impose economic sanctions on us. Okay, so combine that with what's going on with the bubble burst in the banks. I think it will impact on maybe the PRC's uh, willingness to go to war. If, they, they, if they're suffering right now with the, the, the bank bubble burst, and then they have their own people saying, you take Taiwan, here's the price you're gonna pay economically, uh, assuming that we're all strong-willed enough to work together to impose serious sanctions, that will work. Didn't work so well uh, other times, so it might work this time. I don't, I'm not that hopeful. So the the banks bursting is it may affect funding of political warfare, funding of BRI, which is political warfare, uh, United Front and all that we've talked about a little bit. Um, you might see a little bit of a slowdown, but a lot of these is funding of bribery, the funding of the infrastructure, the debt trap uh, funding that they they put Sri Lanka into and, and they're doing in the Solomon Islands now with the Huawei towers uh, and they're doing it all around the world. I don't think it's going to impact it that much. They're, they're different means of conducting political warfare. It may cause them to rear back a bit on the military side until they get stronger financially. But I think you're going to see a self-perpetuating political warfare mechanism. Did you, were you able to hear that? Because I'm, I see you're frozen. Okay. Sweetha, so you're, you're frozen, so I, I'm, I'm yeah. not hearing you. Yeah, uh, so am I audible now, sir? So I'll go to the next question. Okay. The next question I, I don't... is by Meher again. Uh, so how do you view Chinese expansion in Africa? Colonism, colonialism. Um, it's, they're buying one African nation after another. They're, they're, um, as they're, there, there's some very good studies that where they're, uh, what China is doing there isn't just political warfare. It's, it's just buying their way in, investing in the countries. Uh, not not everything is political warfare, but they've made a lot of uh, headway. And again, there's some very good studies on how they're doing that through political warfare, how they're doing it through um, through bribery, coercion, uh, helping set up those uh, surveillance states with many, you know, there's a lot of dictators um, uh, who run countries in Africa. So they're helping a lot of them uh, to build the surveillance states that we talked about earlier under the Digital Silk Road, uh, the nice sounding name of Digital Silk Road. So bottom line is you, you already have, uh, you're, you're going to see some basing of the PLA 
and the Navy uh, in Africa. I think at some point you're going to see um, access certainly for the PLA Air Force in Africa, uh, similar to what, what they have done um, in Somalia and uh, or in, 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 um, what they're trying to do in the Pacific Islands as well. So again, I'd say they're they're pretty successful down in Africa, even though there's pushback because of the racist activities of a lot of Chinese against the African people. Uh, go back and look at them historically. They're they're Han, and Han is a su superior race. And you read their read what they've written over the years, without going into great detail. But they look down, especially on, particularly on black people, and so that racism permeates itself in their operations and activities in Africa. But overall, I'd say they're very successful. You're, you're, off, uh, you're off the net here, Sweetha, if you're trying to, to speak. Uh, Professor, am I okay. audible? Am I audible, okay. yes, sir? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're back. Right. Yeah, I can take the question for you. Uh, this is by Admiral Murli Tren. He has asked, did Kissinger and Nixon ever think of PRC psych when they opened up things for China? Did they ever think of, did Kissinger and Nixon ever think of PRC? Understanding the uh, PRC psyche when they opened up things for oh, China. Oh, psychology. I, I can't I can't speak. You know, Kissinger is still alive, and I can't speak for Richard Nixon. He's dead. Um, I know later on Richard Nixon understood that they may might have created kind of a Frankenstein. Um, Kissinger was a European focused academic who worked his way up pretty well in the U.S. government. Okay, I don't think he understood. Uh, every uh, people I I respect who have looked very closely at that very question. Um, say that they, they don't think Kissinger really completely understood what he was dealing with with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, he, again, he focused all of his career elsewhere, and then he was asked by Nixon to go help open up China to America, the People's Republic of China, and to work with America so we could win the Cold War against the Soviet Union. That was the immediate objective. Nixon later on wrote that he has some regrets over that. He didn't put it exactly that way, but he, he expressed concern over what China did not democratize uh, over three decades or four decades. We naively, a lot of our leaders and academics and China hands were saying, oh yeah, China will become just like us if we just open up to them. Um, and of course that was, that was naive and that was foolish. Um, Nixon saw that it was not happening. It probably wasn't going to happen later. Uh, I'm not sure Kissinger ever did because he got rich off it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Professor. The next question is by uh, from Mr. Sridharan Subramaniam. He has asked, uh, in recent times, uh, you know, India has banned a lot of Chinese apps. It has also banned the Chinese investment. Uh, and also certain investments were brought under very close scrutiny, And uh, India has also explicitly told this is not going to be business as usual. But we find uh, Chinese are looking at new avenues for targeting India. For example, many uh, fake Chinese companies were helped by the public accountants to set up micro loan companies, which not only swindled money, but also collected so much of user data. So uh, how do you think uh, Taiwan, can, uh, Taiwan was able, uh, able to overcome the, these kind of vulnerabilities? Whoa. I cannot say on the business infiltration side that Taiwan has overcome that. Um, that's still a major issue for funneling in money for campaign interference, political campaign interference, funneling it in through Buddhist organizations uh, that have, uh, that have uh, partner relationships with Buddhist temples on in, uh, the PRC and in Taiwan. So going... Uh, Fixing all this, uh, we call it whack-a-mole in America, where you, you, you whack-a-mole coming out of one hole in your yard, and then one pops up another hole. That's how the PRC does operate. 
whether it's organized crime or state-sanctioned organized crime or the CCP itself. So I'm not sure how you fight those pop-up uh, new responses to your sanctions or your you're stopping them coming in under one business auspices, and now they come in under fake businesses. Taiwan has um, found it hard to ban certain apps like WeChat because so many of the people in Taiwan use that. And uh, so they haven't done in, in America, uh, currently under the present administration, hasn't been as forceful in, in blocking the PRC apps like TikTok and others as uh, say Trump was he he did actually ban a few of those and some of those decisions have been reversed so i applaud india for doing that you're you're protecting your country better taiwan again is getting better at a lot of things uh in terms of identifying having legislation to identify and go after illegal money uh and then other uh political warfare operations but they still have to train, and this is a key part that's lacking in America too, they still have to get better training for their legal infrastructure. Their lawyers, their prosecutors have to get better. Their detectives who are either in the, on the military side or on your, your intelligence side or your law enforcement side. The reason I bring this up is because of both Taiwan and the US when they finally got legislation that they could go after some of these organizations in America, we, our, our federal prosecutors blew a number of cases because they, they just weren't experienced in prosecuting them. Same thing happened in Taiwan. So you, again, building capacity to go after them, it's, it's, it's good that you block the applications. It's good that you block the, the money coming in illegally. Part of that though, is if it's illegal, then you have to have not only the rock solid laws, legislation you need to fight it, but also the investigative and prosecutorial uh, capabilities to help to help you to win in court, uh, to prosecute the people and make examples of them. So I realize that may not be the answer you're looking for, but I, I, I can't tell you how to you know, fight these individual uh, permutations of the, the PRC infiltrating your country under various business guises it just takes good law enforcement, good laws, and good prosecutors. Thank you, Professor. The next question is by Ms. Shweta. She has asked, how do you view the recent uh, China's initiative of the Global uh, Development Initiative and Global Security Initiative? With suspicion. <laughs> just... <laughs> Everything's going to be a win-win uh, situation if you listen to the PRC. Everyone, you know, we're going to have this global, you know, kumbaya, sit around the campfire, sing songs together, and everyone's going to be happy uh, with all these initiatives they come up with. It's a new name. It's 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 a new uh, type of chewing gum every day that they're selling. Um, it, it, you you have to go back to what are we dealing with? Ladies and gentlemen, what's the nature of the regime we're dealing with? You always have to come back to that because that drives the answer to every question like this. We are dealing with an expansionist, brutally repressive, genocidal, fascist, totalitarian regime. It's already stated its intentions, and it's not hiding them anymore. It's not Deng Xiaoping to, uh, time anymore where it's just hide your capabilities. And even that he was saying openly, he said, we're going we're gonna to deceive you. And then a lot of, lot of Americans, at least academics, politicians, they were happy to be deceived. Oh, Deng Xiaoping said they're not ready to do anything yet. Well, that was 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, so, you know, the, the nature of the regime tells you every time they come up with a nice new slogan, a nice new campaign to bring countries together, it ain't going to happen the way you think it's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. The nature of the regime dictates what they're doing with all of these. So I don't know all the details of those two new initiatives they've come up with, but uh, the simple answer is I view it with deep suspicion whenever they come up with one, because you know what we're dealing with. I know what we're dealing with. These are people who are highly deceptive. Hasn't been just since the CCP came in power. It goes back thousands of years. That's the nature of how they think deception, stratagems, 
Although I'll go back to the Warring States era, that's been imbued in their minds for thousands of years. The CCP simply put it on steroids. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, in the best interest of time, we are taking one last question, which is mine. Uh, Professor, can you please touch more uh, in your talk? You mentioned about the new department which was created by China, which is the strategic support force. And uh, can you throw more some light on their objective? Because uh, what is the need for a new department if the existing ones are uh, you know, serving their objectives already? As part of Xi Jinping's so-called reforms for the PLA that go back starting around like 2015. So what a lot of the let's focus in on the political warfare mission of the the SSF, the strategic support force. A lot of those uh, political warfare functions were either at the um, the central military commission level and then uh, dispersed down to like the Eastern Theater Command, uh, fronting China or fronting I'm sorry Taiwan and and um, and Japan, uh, or the you know the, the the theater command that's fronting India. Uh, what what um, happened with under these so-called reforms is a lot of functions to include cyber, um, to include political warfare, got put under one. Uh, there's unity of command now for that. Um, there's, it's not all scattered throughout the, the PLA, uh, the liaison department, uh, um, all of these these different political warfare organizations, the media, the uh, PLA news media uh, center. Uh, which is massive it's not just a small center it's massive um so now it's under uh there's unity of command that they can control it they got about 300 uh, the best data that we have right now on classified probably 300,000 soldiers assigned to it not all of them doing political warfare you know some of them doing cyber a lot of them doing cyber warfare um but then they work together with organizations like the two or so two million or so netizens say, who are doing conducting social media warfare. Uh, so you got the strategic support for social media warfare online uh, attacks combined with the netizens out there, then you're facing a pretty big problem. So does that answer your, your question about the strategic support force relatively new to unify the effort across the PLA so you have a much stronger capability for political warfare, cyber warfare, and the other functions within uh, the SSF. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Before we move to the vote of thanks, uh, Sir, uh, uh, Subramaniam Shridharan, Sir, are there any concluding comments from you, Sir, that you would like to add up? Thank you, Mara. And I would say it was an excellent, excellent viewpoints um, uh, that we heard from Professor Shridhar Shanak today. Uh, we have been following many of uh, the Chinese activities, and we know of uh, the uh, various aspects of political warfare that uh, China has engaged not only in Taiwan, but also in the rest of the world, including India. And, um, and uh, the questions that came up in the chat box, uh, but, uh, now some of the concerns that we have had, uh, and Professor Kelly uh, pointed out all those uh, various aspects of uh, the political warfare that China is engaging in. And uh, thank you, Professor Kelly Gishanek, for a wonderful presentation today. And I hope that the young minds as well as the other participants in CPS have benefited extensively from this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now request my colleague, uh, Ms. Sapna, to formally present the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sapna. Sapna, are you there? Bala, I don't think she's there. I can't uh, see her on the screen. I think there's some kind of uh, internet issues, but uh, I'll take one from Sapna. Uh, Professor Kerry, it has always been an uh, you know insightful experience having you with us. Many useful discussions were brought to the table. Uh, I sincerely thank you for taking time out to be with us on behalf of uh, Team C3S and all the distinguished members of Chennai Center for China Studies. Uh, we extend our sincere thanks and gratitude uh, for you know being with us, taking time out to be with us, and having uh, shared your insightful presentation. Uh, I also thank all the distinguished participants who are here with us today. Uh, through their questions, many useful discussions were uh, brought to the table. Uh, we would look forward to interacting more with, uh, more with us in the future. And uh, thank you very much once again, Professor. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be with uh, C3S one more time and look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Professor. Good day.
Thank you, Professor. Thank you.